The reading for this morning's gospel comes from what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's gospel is the first time the teachings of Jesus really come into view, or they're first fully articulated. And with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew is showing us that Jesus is not just any sort of rabbi. He's not simply a teacher of information. That is what we should believe. Nor is he a teacher of morals or how we should behave. Rather, Jesus is a teacher of transformation. Transformation is another way that we can translate the word that is often translated repent. To repent or to be transformed is to change the way you view things, change your sort of inner experience with people, with creation, and with God, teaching us to change from a, a life centered in conventional wisdom to a life centered in God, a life transformed by God's abundant love and mercy from a life that is guided by simply conventional wisdom. So as you go through the Sermon on the Mount, sort of three parts. The first part is where Jesus challenges the traditional or conventional wisdom of what a blessed life is. Blessed, says Jesus, are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are they who mourn. He then challenges the conventional wisdom about humanity's relationship to God, how it's defined, that it isn't something that we achieve as though we're capturing a prize for ourselves to hang on to, but rather it is a calling of life. It is a gift from the Heavenly Father that we are to live more fully into day by day as we grow and are prompted by the Spirit to trust that God's love is poured out into all creation each day and into our lives with each breath. And so Jesus says to them, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Now, you may not see yourself that way, but this is what Jesus says. So he's saying to us in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, let your life be like salt is to food. Let it be a preserver. Let it be a seasoner. Let your life season the life of those around you with the love of God. And let what shines forth from your life be God's love because you never know what darkness the people around you are in. The darkness of loss, of grief, of despair, hopelessness. So let your life shine forth God's love to them in their time. And finally, Jesus illustrates what a life centered in, in God's love looks like as he, can, as he challenges the conventional morality of his day. And each of these things, he, each, each challenge to the conventional morality begins with, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, and this is where we are in the gospel. This is the last of those statements. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for your persecutors so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends his rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. With this sentence, this statement, Jesus is challenging us to grow in our understanding of love and to do so not in the light of conventional wisdom, but in the light of God's love. For conventional wisdom breaks us into groups. On the one hand, we are to love our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, those who love us but not so much to the others because conventional wisdom says that it's those that are like us, that love us, that are around us, 
And then there's those other people over there. So we have us and them, our group and the other group. And Jesus goes further to say, to use these terms that we're used to hearing, that the groups are often down, oftentimes broken into those that are good, those that are righteous, which is typically our group, whatever our group is. And the others... Well, they're the unrighteous, and we might even say from time to time, we might classify them as evil. And these groupings fall into typical things. I mean, the way humanity groups itself by facial features, by skin intonation, by their political affiliation, by their national affiliation, by what they believe and how they believe differently than us. And somehow... This strangely has a way of unifying the group of us against them. It can get us to coalesce and get more tightly affiliated with one another to protect ourselves from those that are not us. Now, it's not such a th tragedy that we do this. and in, in fact, it can be a healthy thing as we're growing up to know who our family is, who we are safe around. But the real tragedy comes not so much from the groupings but how we use the groupings. Instead of seeing diversity as a blessing, we use these groupings to deny people God's blessings. The blessings of creation in access to food and water, in access to leadership positions in civil life, in access to health care. But even worse, we use these divisions to somehow to try to tell God who God should bless, that these people do not live by their lifestyle, by their understanding of faith, and so on. They are outside of the blessings of God. So Jesus uses terms that his hearers would have about those people outside the blessings of God, tax collectors, Gentiles. And he challenges to think beyond such terms. This isn't simply something that is done by individuals or small groups. This is something that is done by nations. This text that comes for us this morning is actually the one appointed for Independence Day. This gospel text, this reading for this morning. And we, like many other nations, have followed the conventional wisdom of dividing people into groups. I mean, if you were to look in the history, I'm not a history student, but I know enough of our nation's history to know that, like many nations, we typically create groups that are our enemies, so we know who we're not. And as we go through our history, well, we can, we can start with the British and then the Spanish. I'm not sure the French ever were our enemies, kind of on and off maybe. We've got the Japanese, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, the Russians, the Native Americans, we have a long history of times where they're our friends and they're not our friends, where they're part of us and deserving of God's blessings of, of freedom and everything else that we say we stand for and do stand for. But then there's times where we say, no, they are our enemies. And this is a very natural, it seems, way that humanity cares for each other, <laughs> views life. But Jesus says in the gospel text that God is no respecter of our divisions. God's loving care, says Jesus, isn't shown just to the people that we think it should go to. God, Jesus says that God sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous and causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. All that the natural world can give us to cause growth in beautiful gardens like this, God sends on everyone. He is no respecter of these divisions that we would like. And so Jesus uses this to challenge us to grow beyond these things, to transform our hearts and minds away from the conventional wisdom to a life centered in God, a life open to the Spirit of God, that we might allow the Spirit of God to draw us more and more, to transform us in our hearts and our souls and our minds and in our strength. And this transformational process 
isn't a one-time thing. It is an ongoing thing because the, the word that Matthew uses when he says so that you can become children of God, it indicates an ongoing process. Perhaps another way of hearing this text is to understand it like this. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in the manner that you are becoming a child of God who pours out God's mercy and care to all people. Ultimately, what Matthew is saying is, is that we are always in a state of becoming, of becoming more and more a child of God, to be transformed more and more by God's presence in our life. And then Jesus, in his last phrase, encourages us and moves us to open ourselves more and more to the daily work of the Spirit, to transform us even more so that our love can more look like God's love, so that our lives will be that seasoning, will be that light of God's love to the people around us, even our enemies. When he says, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, it's not in order, or all of us would just say, okay, I'm out, I'm done. It's hard enough for me to love my friends and family, even my family. But I don't know if I can be perfect. What Jesus is saying is, it, again, an ongoing process. From this day forward, be open to being transformed so that you can be like God, more complete, for God is undivided. He is consistent in his love. God respects no boundaries. God respects no divisions. And so as you are transformed by the Spirit, as the Spirit leads you more and more and draws you into that love and draws you by that love, so be transformed. And in this process, as we go into the confession of our sins, we are in a sense saying that we are not complete. But what draws us ever forward is that same love of God because it is God's nature to pour out God's love, God's very life into us and into all with each breath. So Jesus says, open yourself. Be transformed ever more gently and consistently by the ever-present love of God that's being poured out into life, into creation, into all humanity. Let that love draw you so that your love of people can expand beyond the problematic family members to even your enemies, even those who persecute you. Amen. Now please stand as you are able for our prayers.